Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Liz Mealy. how you're supposed to start one of these. I just got back from doing a tour all over Pakistan, which, not sure the last time you vacationed there. <laughs> it's changed. <laughs> it was intense, it was a lot of culture shock, but I loved it, it was an incredible country. My favorite part of Pakistan is everybody there rides a motorcycle, and by everybody, I mean 14 people, one motorcycle, very talented culture. <laughs> Only thing I couldn't handle is there'd be women on the backs of motorcycles, not wearing helmets, holding babies, also not wearing helmets. I can't, I'm sorry. There's like a liberal white woman inside of me that just wanted to start a charity right on the spot. <laughs> just my tiny little baby helmets, call it No Heads Left Behind. <laughs> Be the change you wanna see in the world, guys. I've toured all over the world the last couple of years and my parents are in their 60s and they've never left the country. So I tried to change that. For Mother's Day last year, I gifted my mom a trip to London the next time I performed there, and she wasn't excited <laughs> at all. But she's like dead inside and doesn't express herself. So just ignored all the signs. So fast forward, a couple months go by, I'm actually already in London, I'm FaceTiming my mom, and I'm just preparing her for the trip. I'm like, I'll meet you at this terminal, make sure you bring your passport, I'd bring a coat, it's actually a very miserable country. <laughs> and she just starts hysterically crying. I was like, why are you crying? She's like, I'm scared and I don't wanna go. And I was like, all right, well, I already bought the ticket, so you are. Remember that conversation from childhood? <laughs> but why are you scared? She goes, well, first of all, what if my plane crashes? And I was like, mom. If you die, you die. <laughs> Not to tell you, in your 60s, you've had five kids. We're all adults now. We don't really need you anymore. <laughs> Man, it kind of feels like a you problem. <laughs> what else? She was like, ISIS. I was like, ISIS, if they haven't recruited me, they're not gonna recruit you. You've had two knee surgeries. <laughs> Get on the plane. We're gonna look at pale people. <laughs> it's gonna be dope. I do like London. I would say the coolest thing I've ever seen happened the last time I was there. I was doing a bunch of shows. I was coming home late at night and I was walking towards my friend's apartment where I was staying. As I get closer to her apartment building, I notice a cop arresting a dude against her apartment building door. Now I'm scared of cops in this country. I'm not gonna fuck with them in another country. So I just kind of hung back and I was gonna wait for it to end. But after a couple of minutes, the dude being arrested looked at me and then the cop looked at me. And I was like, I, um, I, uh, I, 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 I live there. And in unison, they were like, ah, sorry, love, and moved out of the way together. <laughs> this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. It's like they were playing cops and robbers. <laughs> Come on, I call my boyfriend every single day and we don't communicate that seamlessly. <laughs> I call him up crying afterwards. I was like, I just don't feel connected to you. Can we get handcuffs? <laughs> I heard it's been working for other couples. <laughs> Craziest tour I ever did, I did a tour all over the Middle East uh, performing for the troops, the American ones, because we're everywhere. Um, <laughs> that's a sad joke, you're right. Um, <laughs> There's some of those in there. I, uh, I did a show in Jordan, and after the show, it was too dangerous for them to drive me and the other comics back to our hotel, so we all stay in tents on the base. I was with three guy comics, so the three guy comics got their own tent, and then I had my own tent that was labeled women only. I was like a little uncomfortable with that. And the guys were like, why? You scared? You scared to be alone? I was like, no man. None of these tents are labeled, yet mine says unconscious pussy here. <laughs> and I don't think it's for the terrorists. <laughs> so we had a lady 
lady guide. And I asked the lady guide, I was like, hey, if I got to pee in the middle of the night and go to one of these porter potties, is it safe? And she's like, from what? <laughs> like animals? I'm like, I don't know, do camels rape? <laughs> Bitch, we've all read the same articles. You know what I'm talking about. I want a lesbian lady troop to watch me sleep. <laughs> That's my request. I want her to watch me sleep, pet my hair, fall in love with me, protect me. I peed in a tent, is what I'm saying. It's <laughs> totally scary, guys. <laughs> Favorite place I've ever been, I did a tour all over Australia for a month. And I'm going to be honest, I've been to 30 countries, I haven't learned anything, I try not to. Um, I don't want to grow as a person, I don't want to be cultured, it feels like a real responsibility. So I do no research before I go to a new place. Everything I do in my free time just kind of comes from my heart. So, with Australia, in the fourth grade, I wrote a book report about koalas, so I was like, oh, I'm going to hold a koala. Didn't know if you could do it told all my friends anyway, and they were all dicks about it because they all just sent me articles about how gross koalas are. <laughs> articles about how they smell bad. How they try to rub their glands on you. <laughs> how they all have chlamydia. <laughs> I was like, so do boys. It hasn't stopped me from holding them. <laughs> know your audience. I had one good friend. I had one friend that told me they're starting to find out that the koalas only have chlamydia in their pouches. And I was like, well, that's also where women keep their chlamydia. <laughs> I mean, they don't give us pockets. It's like, where else are you going to keep it? I know you're stressed out. I did hold my koala. I spent way too much money on something that lasted two minutes. That has to be how men feel about prostitution. <laughs> It was awesome. We didn't talk. We took pictures, also assuming how prostitution goes down. And then I wrote a joke about it, and now it's a work expense. So who's winning at life, really? I will be taking all tax-related questions after the show. I, uh, I showered for you guys. Yeah, it, yeah, you're welcome. It's, uh, it's been happening less and less. I did my hair, that's obvious. It looks amazing. <laughs> yeah, that's also been happening less and less. I don't know what to tell you guys. I read an article three years ago that said washing your hair was bad for it, and I just took that to the furthest extent. <laughs> Gross, all the time. But it must be doing something because women are always touching my hair. And I don't know why black women don't want their hair touched, but I don't want my hair touched because I'm gross. I'm a carrier. I started the flu season. The other thing is, let's be honest, somebody, this is professionally done. Somebody straightened my hair and then recurled it because I have naturally curly hair that can't be trusted. It can't, I'm sorry, I don't have to tell you. I wish my mom sat me down as a child and told me that most days it wouldn't respond to hair products or reason. It never, sorry, if you don't have curly hair, maybe you don't know what I'm saying. In certain weather, it just gets bigger <laughs> and bigger and frizzier and frizzy. Honestly, every time it rains, it looks like someone just broke up with me. <laughs> it's just women stopping me on the street like, you don't need them. <laughs> this is your year, BYOB, be your own boyfriend. <laughs> Respect your essence. <laughs> I do like my curls. I try to wear my hair natural as much as possible. It just seems to make me look very ethnically ambiguous. People don't know what I am. Uh, I get Puerto Rican a lot. I get Middle Eastern all the time. Half black, half white, Jewish. Honestly, anything but Asian. I get it and it's fine. But people need to start talking about like my injustices. Like what about all the opportunities I've lost because people don't know I'm white? <laughs> Where's my march? I paid for my own college, but I didn't appreciate it like a white person. These are the issues. <laughs> probably talking about white privilege in this country. I think it's important. I think we should be talking about it. I just don't understand why it hasn't opened up the dialogue to talk about all the other types of privileges. Like what about pretty privilege? Yeah, I've been on both sides of pretty privilege, by the way. Cause like I'm gotten free sandwiches cute. 
<laughs> but I've been upstaged by had her rent paid hot. <laughs> And it is heartbreaking. <laughs> so this is my story. I live in New York. I live in Brooklyn. I live above a deli. I would say three, four times a week. I go in this deli once a week, get a free sandwich, $4 value. Makes me feel gorgeous. <laughs> two weeks ago, I walk in. This really pretty girl orders a falafel platter, two sodas, and a brownie. Gets it all for free. And I was like, what the fuck, Ami? That's like an $11 value. <laughs> I was upset. And then I ran upstairs and I complained to my roommate and she's like, you get free sandwiches? <laughs> yeah, bitch, for a week, I'm gorgeous. <laughs> you need to try harder. <laughs> I live in New York. I've lived in New York. Well, I lived in New York for 15 years now and I do this every single night of the week. I don't think people really understand our lifestyle. Every single night I do some shows. Every single night I come home between 11 p.m. and two in the morning. I've been doing it half my life. It doesn't really bother me. It mostly doesn't bother me because I have all the weapons on my keychain. <laughs> if you're not familiar with these weapons, I have pepper spray. I have a safety cat. If you don't know what that is, that's brass knuckles that look like a cat. <laughs> it is adorable. It is illegal. It has been taken away from me. Oh. <laughs> Last time it was taken away from me was at jury duty. The cop picked it up and he goes, ma'am, this is illegal. And I went, so is rape. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Good news. He didn't give it back. <laughs> but it's $15 on Amazon. There is a dog version, but get the cat. It's cuter. And I also have a knife, so I have all the weapons. And I'm not gonna lie to you. I'm not gonna say I never get worried walking home late at night. That's not the truth. The truth is, is when I do get worried, it's like a very mixed feeling. So I say like 50% of the time, I'm like terrified and wanna run. And then the other 50% of the time, I'm like, tonight's the night, let's do murder! <laughs> because I've seen all the Marvel movies, I'm ready. <laughs> I'm the same height as Scarlett Johansson. I just need a bodysuit. <laughs> so this is what happened a couple months ago. I was coming home at two in the morning. I'm like a 15 minute walk from the subway. And at this point, I'm two blocks away from my apartment. And this guy starts walking pretty aggressively towards me. And he shouts, do you live in this neighborhood? And I ignored him, I just kept walking. And he got in my face and he's like, why are you scared? <laughs> Cool, okay, um, <laughs> just in case we're not all on the same page, here's a list of appropriate questions you can ask a woman walking home alone <laughs> at two in the morning. <laughs> there are none. <laughs> There's literally nothing you could ask me. You could shout, my baby's on fire, do you have any suggestions? <laughs> and I wouldn't say anything. I might shout like, try water, but I'm not stopping. <laughs> Come on, dude, we all had tiny computers in our pockets. Why am I your only vessel of knowledge? Yeah. And I know what you're gonna say. You're gonna be like, well, what if his phone was dead? Well, so is that baby. It's not my problem. <laughs> shit together. I don't do drugs anymore. I, uh, I haven't done drugs in like 10 years and uh, I really don't miss them, especially towards the end, they just became like mystical panic attacks. It was just me crying in a corner being like, why is this dragon also disappointed in me? <laughs> Stop being fun. But uh, I did everything by the way. I drank a lot, I smoked a lot of pot, but the big thing I did is I did a lot of pharmaceuticals. And if you wanna know which ones, your guess is as good as mine. <laughs> I would take random shit people gave me and stuff I found on the ground. That's crazy behavior. I'm in my 30s now. When a doctor prescribes me something, I scrutinize it. I ask for the side effects and the symptoms and what pharmaceutical company bought him out that he's prescribing me this exact brand. I'm obnoxious. But when I was 16, I took floor drugs. <laughs> And when you do shit like that, you don't know the outcome. So sometimes we'd get high, and sometimes I'd be like, I'm not high, dude, but my blood pressure feels amazing. <laughs> do we have 
more of this? I want to give it to my dad. <laughs> T- tiny lie. I, uh, I did do a drug recently. I, um, I took Xanax. Is anybody else? Sad? Yeah. That feels like that's my audience. Uh, Sorry, if you you don't know what Xanax is, it's to treat anxiety. It's like an anti-inflammatory for your thoughts and feelings. (laughs) I'm going to be truthful. I didn't didn't get it from a psychiatrist. I got it from my mom. She's a veterinarian. Uh, She's actually been my drug dealer since 1992, whether she knows it or not. I don't have health insurance. She's still my primary doctor. I just show her rashes against her will. She loves our relationship. <laughs> truth was I was having a really rough time for a while and I told my mom about it and she gave me a shit ton of Xanax like a small business starting amount of Xanax <laughs> and I didn't take it I heard it was highly addictive I didn't want to be a part of it so I just carried it around with me for like two years like it was a safety blanket and then I had a panic attack at 3 a.m. and I felt like I had no options and I was like let's go on a journey Liz <laughs> I guess because I've used drugs for 10 years, I thought I was going to get high. But you actually don't get high, guys. Do you know what really happens? You just don't hate yourself. <laughs> Did you know that was an option? <laughs> what if I used drugs for 10 years? If I knew there was one out there that was like, hey! You're cool. <laughs> what about your day? I believe in you. Is that your hair killing it? <laughs> it's a great drug. Highly recommend it. Everybody should do it. I just don't want it. I really don't. I want to get rid of it. I want to get rid of it after shows. Don't get excited. You're not getting my Xanax. Um, this is after a very specific show. You guys are laughing. This is already a great show. That doesn't always happen. Oh, God. Uh, a lot of times, this stuff gets nothing. And I actually feel bad for the audience. They pay for tickets. They pay for parking. They pay for babysitters. So I want to give those people my Xanax. <laughs> right? Because then afterwards, somebody will be like, oh, my God, how was her show? And they'll be like, not good. But I feel very calm and collected around her. I won't be back. I can't give away all my drugs because life is hard and sometimes you need help. I have yet to meet anybody that relates to this next story, so let's see how it goes. I, um, about two weeks ago, somebody hacked into my bank account and stole all the money in my account. Cool, let's recap. I had a little bit of money, and now I have no money. So it's technically a cryptocurrency. If anybody wants to invest in LizCoin, it is worthless. So this is what happened. I went to deposit money into my account. I see there's no money. I have a full panic attack, and I just start asking calm questions. Like, what the fuck happened to my money, TD Bank? You were supposed to be watching it. go inside. This woman goes, apparently it looks like several different people were going into your account and pulling money out of your account. And I was like, well, who are these people? Are there names attached to it? And she goes, the first name is Mildred Cacophagus. And I was like, do I look like I have 90-year-old Greek friends? Like, why didn't you stop them? And she goes, well, we don't know if you suddenly became generous and just started giving all your money away. And I was like, well, why don't you ask? Like, who sees a bank account empty in a day and thinks, what a good person. (laughs) You're the fraud department. Your whole job is to be suspicious. Like, a bunch of people gangbanged my account and you gave them the benefit of the doubt? (laughs) Are you insane? Let's let's talk about the real issue here. I'm a broke person. They know that. I know that. Broke people don't give their money away. (laughs) Broke people spend their money. That's how they became broke. So she's like, do you want to look at your fraudulent charges? I was like, yeah. Yeah, I do. She's like, all right, first one. $2,000 to buy a bouncy castle? That can't be you. It was me. I see the issue. (laughs) I'm a millennial. That was going to be an epic weekend. (laughs) Ran the shit out of that. (laughs) I am in my mid-30s. Oh, God. I I am. You can't tell because this outfit is wildly inappropriate. (laughs) I don't have kids. Why would I change? (laughs) This is the thing, is that I'm not aging. I, 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 like, I like it in the city. The city's awesome. You get a 10% discount if you have student ID, and I'm constantly getting asked if I have student ID. And it's the best because they're like, do you have it? And I'll be like, ah, oh, fuck, I 
left in 2003. Um, <laughs> and I know it's a blessing, blah, blah, blah. But I, I've, been, I've been trying to figure out for years why I'm not aging, and I think I figured it out this year. I have very oily skin. So I say the pro of oily skin is it's a natural moisturizer all day long. The con of oily skin is I'll go over to a friend's place and she'll be like, is it raining? <laughs> Gross, all the time. And I thought I ended there. I thought I just physically looked immature, but there's something about this lifestyle. There's something about not having the responsibilities that my friends do. I just, I don't always process information like the rest of the world. I didn't see it until like a week ago. Cause I had a really bad day last week. Just like one of those days that just kind of knocks you on your ass and I just cried for a solid hour. Just like a gross, aggressive pity cry. And then I called my best friend from high school, like right when I was done crying, like when I was still sniffly cause I wanted her to ask what was wrong. <laughs> she picks up the phone and she's like, hey dude, what's up? And I was like, dude, I'm having the worst day. I was like working on this email for work. It was super intricate, had all these moving parts. It took me four hours. And then I was five minutes from being done, and I deleted it. I deleted it, and I tried to get it back, and I couldn't get it back. So then I searched the internet for an hour to see if it'll ever come back, and the internet's like, it's never coming back. And I fucking hate my life, and this shit always happens to me, and I fucking want to die. And she was like, okay. Sorry that happened to you, and that really sucks, and you're allowed to be upset. And I'm actually really glad you called, because I am also having a really bad day. And I was like, shit, dude, what's up? And she's like, I, um, I just had a miscarriage. And I was like, wow. We're having the same day. <laughs> so well, thank you. It's been a rough journey polishing that joke. I, uh... <laughs> I'm a mess. I'm sure that's, that's coming across. I, uh... I'm, I'm a mess, but, and I've been a mess my whole life, but people have this preconceived notion that like, if you were a mess when you were younger, you'll like somehow grow out of it. But I think if you do it right, you just become more efficient at being a mess. So my example is I have all the traffic violations, all of them. And I know what you're thinking. You're like, maybe you should speed less, Liz, or stop hitting things. It's like, I don't do that. I don't have a day job. I go to traffic court. I like traffic court. I do, because I used to have a day job, and I have all these old work clothes, and I like to play dress up. I like to dress up as the daughter my parents wanted me to be. And then, like, 65% of the time, it works out. So 65% of the time, they're like, not guilty, but guilty of looking adorable. Is that a polka dot blazer? Good for you. It's 9 a.m. and you showed up on time because they have very low expectations of you. If you're not doing well, it feels like a hug. You should not do that. Everybody knows. Let's be real. I've hit a lot of things with my car. <laughs> Nothing with feelings, just a couple of walls, an armadillo once. Oh man, the armadillo came out of nowhere. They're so fast. <laughs> I'm an animal lover. I went to go check if it had a heartbeat. I'm gonna go with they don't have hearts. Uh, wasn't sure, I called my dad for backup. He's a veterinarian. He's like, well, this isn't vet school, Liz. And I was like, well, this isn't time for disappointment talk, dad. I'm trying to save an armadillo. <laughs> He hung up on me, I buried it, I didn't, I kicked it out of my way. But, I didn't take a selfie with it, I thought it was a dinosaur. I've never seen that before, I was like, I'm an archeologist, I'm gonna be famous. Okay, if you're wondering if all these mistakes have caught up with me, they have. I got my car five years ago, and my car insurance five years ago was $127 a month. I don't know if that's a lot of money for you. All I know is I live in New York City, I pay a million dollars in rent, and then I have to find another $127. I haven't had an avocado in years. <laughs> Just not in my budget. <laughs> and then three months ago, I woke up to an email, and now my car insurance is $427 a month. A month. Do you know what that means? That means I received an email that was like, hey, Miss Mealy, we just want to let you know from now on, 
We'll be taking your savings. <laughs> and I was like, joke's on you, Geico. I've never had one. I tried to set my car on fire, and now I'm an Uber. Who needs a ride home? <laughs> I'll get up to a two-star rating. I would buckle up. <laughs> I don't know what you guys do after you've destroyed your own lives. <laughs> I like to give back. You know what? You're a lost cause. Maybe give to the community. So... I started small. I cleaned my best friend's closet last week. Is that charity work? I'm gonna write it off as such. <laughs> well, you should know about our friendship. Uh, we both travel for a living, so it's kind of rare that we're in town at the same time. But when we are, I usually go over to his place and we go for walks. I walk my friend, essentially. <laughs> and he's always doing errands in between these walks. And I don't wanna say what he was doing a couple weeks previously was folding laundry, because that wouldn't be accurate. Because what I watched my friend do was take all of his clean socks and shove them into a grocery bag, and all of his clean boxers and shove them into a grocery bag, and then he opened his closet, which looked like a cartoon closet. Like skis came out, and a basketball he's never played with fell out, and a child he didn't know he had escaped. And then he shoved these bags into the closet, and he quickly shut the door. And I was like, no. No. So I took it upon myself to help him because I read that book, The Magical Art of Tidying Up. It's now a Netflix show. Okay, if you don't know anything about it, all you need to know is this author wants you to have a conversation with all of your possessions and then get rid of most of them. It's written by a Japanese woman that has no friends. I know she has no friends because there's a chapter called Sentimental Things. And what she suggests you do with Sentimental Things, if you're not touching it every day, if it's not an active part of your life, she wants you to thank them for their services and then throw them away. She's a heartless bitch that has never felt love. She had some great ideas and I try to implement them on my friends. <laughs> so the thing she's known for, the thing that kind of made her famous is what she does with clothes. So she wants you to take everything out of your drawers, everything out of your closet, pick up each garment individually and ask, does this bring me joy? If it does, you keep it. If it doesn't, you get rid of it. My friend did something a little differently. What he would do is pick up every t-shirt and give me the oral history behind every shirt and then fight for its livelihood. <laughs> He's like, Michelle gave this to me three years ago when we were in Toronto. It never fit me, and I never liked it. And I was like, great, donate pile. He's like, ah, it was a gift. Can't get rid of it. It was a gift. Yeah, yeah, it was a gift. It was a gift. A woman that doesn't like you gave you a shirt that you've never worn, that you don't enjoy. You live in a studio. You don't have room for hateful, misfitting memories. <laughs> Give it to someone who needs it. 200 shirts. He did that for 200 shirts. It's like I had a front row ticket to Shirts, the one-man show. <laughs> one of the most exhausting experiences of my life. He texted his mom to tell her what I was doing. She texted me back directly and thanked me like I was a religious figure. She's like, what can my family do for you? To thank you for what you've done for our family. And can you clean his desk? <laughs> I was like, no, no more pro bono cleaning. You released him into the wild too early. I've seen his shower. He was never ready. <laughs> 34 was too soon. <laughs> I'm uh, very angry. Um, I don't, I've been angry my whole life. I don't, I, I just have like constant road rage in my heart at all times. And I've tried to be healthy about it. I really have. I would say that I disperse maybe like 50% of my anger through like running and working out. I'm definitely like a gym rat. I would say like the other 40% kind of gets um, uh, pushed out through like yelling at strangers and my therapist, <laughs> like that's really helpful. And then the last 10% is just definitely hitting things with my car. Yeah. Um, you should try it, it's a really good stress relief. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I have to say running has been the, the thing that's really saved me and helped me. So yeah, that's, a very telling reaction. Um, it's a bunch of murderers in the back. Uh, we've also been saved by running. God help us if we injure ourselves. But that's what happened. So I injured my knee and I had to give up running for a while. And all my friends were like, you should do yoga. It's so healing, you should do yoga. And I'm sure it is, but I feel like these women know me and maybe they could have warned me I might not have the temperament for yoga. It's not just stretching. 
But I wanted to feel better. And there was like this deal in my neighborhood. It was $30 for three weeks. And I am my father's daughter. So I went every single day to get my money's worth. <laughs> and I try to take it seriously. So I get there 10 minutes early. I'd unroll my mat. And I was like, let's do yoga. <laughs> yoga. I don't know how it works. And this is what happened every class. The teacher would look me in the eyes. And she would ask me, do you have any injuries? And I'd be like, oh, yeah. I hurt my knee. And then she would say, keep off it. <laughs> no, fuck, keep off it. Like a dog knows to keep off it. Like I thought she was gonna give me alternative positions so I wouldn't injure it further, or other positions so it would heal faster. Like I get that she gave up on life and professionally bends for a living. But I thought she was gonna help me so I hated her and I wanted her to die and have too much free time so I decided to fuck with her <laughs> by the fourth class I had lost all patience same thing happens she goes do you have any injuries and I said only emotional ones <laughs> She didn't skip a beat. She was like, stay in child's pose the whole class. <laughs> Touche, bitch. All right. Namaste. The light in me sees the psychology degree in you. Why don't you just say you were taking night classes? I would have been friendlier. <laughs> I kind of know where some of this anger comes from. I'm originally from New Jersey, so I've always been trash. <laughs> <laughs> Those are just facts, and you just have to own it. Um, but I, I, I've been in New York for 15 years now, and there's just not enough room to grow a heart. So I'm not always the best version of myself. I was in a CVS a couple of months ago, more like around the holidays, just picking up regular items, toilet paper, bar of soap, no basket, just holding my items. I'm at the front of the line, and this older lady comes up to me, and she's just holding a greeting card. She's like, I just have this card. I'm in a rush. Can I cut in front of you? I was like, totally fine. But there's still a guy being helped at the counter. So I'm playing a game on my phone and she's just kind of awkwardly standing next to me. And finally she turns to me and she goes, my best friend's mother died. And I was like, I'm sorry to hear that. And she goes, yeah, she died during the holidays. And you know how that is. She always associate the death of her mother with the holidays. It's going to ruin the holidays for the rest of her life. And I was like, Sure. <laughs> she goes, you know, when my own mother died, and I was like, what the fuck? I agreed to let you cut in line, but I didn't agree to this sadness open mic that you're starting. But dude, there are eight million people in this city. This is my alone time. <laughs> I'm clearly playing a game on my phone, trying to win it so that I can intrinsically know that I am smarter than my boyfriend. <laughs> ruining this moment for me. <laughs> say any of that because I am a really nice person. <laughs> what I did do is I called my best friend and I just ranted the whole way home and she was an asshole about it. She's like, dude, she's old. You know, with old people, they start to lose people in their life. Their health starts to fade and really you were doing a service for your community. And I was like, first of all, I said older. I didn't say old. She was like 55 or 90. She was black. I don't know. <laughs> so she does have a friend. She said her best friend's mother died. She has one friend. I don't have to tell you, greedy bitch, you only get one friend. You get one friend and a husband that kind of listens to you. That's all you get in life. You don't get extra friends. The point of the story is I'm on my phone too much. It's obvious. I'm a millennial. I'm constantly on my phone. My dad's always giving me shit about it. He's like, your generation. I was like, don't give me that your generation shit because I'm of the generation that's not actually murdering people because we're too busy on our phones. <laughs> Yeah, did you know this? The number of serial killers have gone down since the prevalence of smartphones. <laughs> Sounds like a real fact, doesn't it? <laughs> it's not. I made it up. It doesn't matter. All that matters is if I'm on the subway and I see a dude not on his phone, I assume he's a serial killer, and that's how I've stayed alive all these years. <laughs> <laughs> We all remember 10 years ago when we weren't constantly on our phones and it was a horrible existence. Why do I have to be present for all these boring moments? The bank line, there's no reason I need to be present for the bank line. And there's always some person making that experience worse. There's always some lady that's like counting quarters in front of the bank teller. 10 years ago, I hated that lady. I plotted that lady's death. I don't do that anymore. Now I see quarter lady, I get on my phone. I open Instagram. I start liking cat pictures, get the blood pressure down. <laughs> 10 minutes go by, quarter lady passes me, I whisper, grumpy cat saved your life. 
<laughs> yeah. Need to give her a follow. You almost died, bitch. I feel like it needs to be mentioned that Grumpy Cat died this year. I know. Dude, I've been single-handedly breaking that news across the country. I don't know why everyone's not aware of it. Oh, I mean, I know we're all shook. Thank you for coming out. Um, I loved her. I really did. You, most of you don't even know it was a her. I loved her. I, I loved her so I'm wearing her socks right now. I have all her merchandise. I, um... <laughs> I truly did. I found out she died and I was like, I couldn't handle it. I went and researched how she died. This is how she died. Complications to a UTI. It's a multi-million dollar cat. Get it some cranberry juice. <laughs> Every woman in here has had a UTI. We figured it out. You're a bad cat, mom. You shouldn't be allowed to have any multi-million dollar cats. <sighs> God rest her soul, grumpy cat forever. <laughs> I'm crazy. That's sure, that's coming across. I'm crazy. I'll say this. I'm not the craziest person in my family. Uh, my dad's a big self-help guru. He's read all the books. If you're not familiar with the works, it's like how to win friends and influence people. Seven habits of highly effective people. Awaken the giant within. It's always that aisle in Barnes and Nobles where there's always like one white guy that looks lost that hasn't had fun in a while. <laughs> that's my dad, guys. <laughs> and he made us read those books as kids, not young adults. 12-year-old kids <laughs> to make a friend until college. So my, uh, my little brother has bipolar one. If you don't know anything about mental illness, there's bipolar two, which is depression and mania. And then there's bipolar one, which is depression, mania, psychotic break. My brother's been a lot of people. Uh, my brother's been Jesus. He made a great Jesus. I would have followed him anywhere. Yeah, so many fun adventures. So about eight months ago, during his last psychotic break, he set fire to all my father's books in the living room. His episodes have happened a lot. Didn't even phase my mom. She came downstairs at 3 a.m. and she was like, hey! What you doing, buddy? He's like, making a fire. She's like, why aren't you using wood? He's like, we're out! <laughs> Huge pile of wood next to the fireplace. <laughs> so the next day, my mom calls me up and she's like, Hey, just want to let you know, your brother set fire to all your father's self-help books. And you know what? Sanest thing anyone in this family's <laughs> ever done. I didn't even stop him, I encouraged him. I was like, did you get his Tony Robbins cassettes in his car? <laughs> and they're the ones that ruined every family vacation. <laughs> my dad wasn't even that upset. He's like, ah, it's fine. I got second copies in my room. <laughs> Give him his Christmas gifts to change lives. <laughs> I like my mom. My mom is, uh, my mom's in her 60s now. And I don't say that to say that she's old because she does CrossFit and I'm scared of her. <laughs> My mom, like I said, she's a veterinarian. She's been a cat specialist for 30 years, and she's killed a lot of cats. <laughs> she's very prepared for death. I know she's prepared for death because she's oddly been planning hers, like, my entire life. So, like, a fun fact that I know about my mother is that when she dies, she wants to be cremated. And I know this because she'll just, like, randomly update us every two to three months. <laughs> Not exaggerating. My mom will walk into a room and be like, update. <laughs> Don't want to be cremated. <laughs> and then she goes and makes the sandwich. It's weird. Weird part about it, she never actually updated until last year at Christmas dinner. She stood up in the middle of dinner and she's like, update! Still want to be cremated. But I was on the internet and I saw you could put my ashes in a plant, so I want to be a plant now. I was like, Mom, you don't want to be a plant. She's like, no, I saw it on Facebook. I can be a plant now. I was like, Mom, you don't want to be a plant. Because if you're a plant in our family, you're going to die again two weeks later. <laughs> you know the argument with my siblings? Like, who forgot to water Mom? <laughs> basil plants in the last six months. And a friend of mine was trying to make me feel better. She was like, well, actually, basil plants are really finicky. And I was like, oh, my mom. <laughs> I'll be honest, though, if you're like me and you travel a lot, you want somebody to take that job a little more seriously, I think you should just tell people your plants are your relatives. It's like, if you could water my mom and feed my dad, that'd be great. <laughs> I'm 
be like, your cat's your dad? And I'll be like, yeah, it looks at me disapprovingly, just like my father. I kind of assume all cats are my father. Actually, don't feed the cat. He'll fucking figure it out. <laughs> Both my parents are, are veterinarians, which I've always liked. I will say this. It's, uh, it's definitely affected my dating life. I'll explain. Um... <laughs> I gave the last guy I slept with ringworm? <laughs> yeah, you guys wanna hear that story? Oh man, it's, uh, it's recent. Um, it's interesting. It's currently unresolved. Um, let's rewind a little bit. I'm in bed with this guy, I got a rash on my stomach, and I was like, hey man, what do you think this is? And he's like, I don't know. And I was like, I think it's cancer. And then we laughed and we laughed. <laughs> Jews. They have a dark sense of humor, and I know he thought it was cancer. <laughs> so like a week goes by, I'm getting ready for this tour. I always drop my cat off with my mom because she's a vet, and I know she's not going to let it die. So we're sitting at the kitchen table, and my mom starts putting all this ointment on her arm, and I'm like, oh, what's wrong with your arm? And she's like, oh, I fucking have ringworm all over my arm, and I can't get rid of it. And I stood up, I lifted up my shirt, and I was like, is this ringworm? <laughs> He's like, yeah, it's totally ringworm. <laughs> Like, I don't know, maybe your cat gave it to you. I go, Mom, I have an indoor cat. Why the fuck does my cat have ringworm? She's like, I don't know. Every couple of weeks you go on tour, you drop your cat off like I'm some kind of shelter. Like, I don't have shit to do. Like, somehow this is my responsibility. Like, I don't want to go places. Like, I don't want to see my friends. Maybe I want to go on tour one day. And I was like, oh, God. <laughs> okay. Um, I get that you're angry that I don't pay you. <laughs> but we got a problem. Pretty sure I gave the last guy I slept with ringworm, and she's like, we're not close enough for you to tell me that. <laughs> <laughs> cool. All right, uh, how do I get rid of it? She's like, I'll give you some ointment, put it on every day for two weeks, and it'll go away. And I was like, can I have two ointments? <laughs> Someone make the phone call. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? That like, I have chlamydia, now you do two phone call. I've never made that phone call and I'm not gonna start with something weird like ringworm, I'm not doing it. So I was gonna make up my own process. I was gonna send him a tube in the mail. Right with like a really friendly, thoughtful note that was like, I'm so sorry. But my mom gave you ringworm. <laughs> You sleep with me, you sleep with my mom's guys. How fun is that? Does nobody want this? Oh, I actually officially gave my cat to my mom. It was a, this was a hard decision. I know, I just, I traveled too much. It wasn't fair to her. So I, I didn't kill her. I didn't put her up for adoption. I forced my mother to take care of her in case my lifestyle changes or I change my mind. And I say all this just because if abortion ever becomes illegal in all 50 states, feels like it's more a future problem for my mother. <laughs> right, because I don't take care of things. I didn't take care of something that could be left alone for four days. What do you think I'm going to do with a baby that can't be left alone for like more than two days? <laughs> I'm not responsible. The government doesn't take that into account. And keep in mind, my cat's fine. My mom's a veterinarian. My cat's living her best life. My cat now has better health insurance than I do. <laughs> Truthfully, I just found out this year that my mom regularly performs cat abortions, so now there's a future where one day my cat might have more rights than I do. <laughs> How fun is that for her? Dude, that's a sad clap. <laughs> Dude, I'll be honest, when I, when I found out my mom performed cat abortions, I looked her directly in the eye and I asked her, I was like, how confident are you about doing that on people? <laughs> well, people know I make a lot of mistakes. <laughs> I'm trying to figure my future options are. I get, I get it, I get that nobody wants to talk about it. It's like a really scary future. But I think we can all agree that if it does happen, my mom's gonna be a hero. <laughs> documentary heroes where she's like a cat clinic during the day, an abortion clinic at night. There'll be fun code words like, take me to the kill shelter. <laughs> That's the funniest thing I've ever written, and it's not, yeah, you gotta, thank you. It's just so, it's so, so dark, but yet so true. It's like, sir, are you, am I gonna finish my cat abortion joke? I will, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> My mom's been doing this for 30 years, I had no idea.
I called my little sister up like it was scandalous. She's like, yeah, everybody knows. And I was like, nobody shares the fun stuff with me. <laughs> I didn't get it. Really, I didn't get it. I, I asked my mom, I was like, I don't understand why a cat would ever need an abortion. And she's like, well, there's a lot of reasons a cat might want to get an abortion. <laughs> this last cat just wanted to go to Cancun. <laughs> I feel like more people should be proud of me. Not for that last joke, obviously. <laughs> English isn't my first language. Uh, my first language is emojis. Yeah. You see it, pretty much Japanese. Nobody liked that joke, okay. Uh, I almost exclusively text in emojis because uh, I'm dyslexic. They found out in the third grade I couldn't read at all. It's still a very shaky concept for me. If you don't know anything about dyslexia, it's a learning disability. It makes it more difficult to read, write, spell, memory, math, school. It's just 12 to 16 years of torture. And it's just the foundation of communication. My life is hard. And then, I'm fine with it. I, I, I mean, I've been dealing with it m my whole life. I don't need you to have like pity for me. I, I don't, it's an invisible disability, but you don't need to like change your lifestyle for me. Like if we're on the train together, you don't need to give up your seat. But if you see me reading a book, maybe give me a high five. <laughs> I've been reading it for six months. No, I don't know what it's about. <laughs> Borderline a prop. <laughs> and the thing, I've been dealing with it my whole life. I'm fine with it. I'm really not that insecure. I would say the only time my insecurities start to come back is like the first two weeks of dating a new guy. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? It's like a never ending text message. You wake up, you go to bed, you're constantly texting. And that's a very important time for me. So I'm just gonna say it. I'm cute enough. Okay? What I get with my face is enough. But if I wanna reach that next level of pretty person, if I wanna go outside of what my face can get, I'm fucking witty, I'm witty, I'm quick, I'm fast. You guys don't see it. <laughs> I'm telling you, I have LOL'd a dude into a boner. I've seen it. <laughs> but you can't be funny via text if you don't have good timing, and you can't have good timing if you don't know how to spell, okay? <laughs> so, if I'm texting a boy and I'm at home, I have resources. I can ask Siri. I'll be like, Siri, how do you spell tomorrow? And she's like, I got you, girl. <laughs> T O. Do you guys know the rest of it? <laughs> but if I'm not at home, if I'm on the subway, there's no Wi-Fi. I'm an adult human that's had to ask another adult human how to spell with an urgency that makes no sense. <laughs> I once tapped a man on the shoulder and I was like, dude, how do you spell matrimony? Hurry it up. He's like, are you flirting with me? Is this a pickup line? I was like, no, I'm trying to fuck a dude in my phone and I need some assistance. <laughs> One or two words, cannot figure it out. <laughs> the internet is a <laughs> Enjoying that too much, and that makes me so uncomfortable. Uh, I, am, I, am, uh, I am seeing a new guy right now. He's, um, he's colorblind. And not like hipster douche doesn't see race. I actually think he thinks I'm Puerto Rican. <laughs> legit doesn't see certain colors and I found that so fascinating so we made out and then I went home and I googled like what can he see <laughs> right because I'm, I'm in a very weird place in my life I'm in my 30s so like one half of me is like I want a boyfriend and I want to be in a relationship and then the other half of me is like tired and doesn't want to try anymore <laughs> this is my example. I, uh, I suffer from hormonal acne, so like every two weeks my face explodes, I have all these acne scars. And when I do a show for people and money, I put on makeup, because I'm lovely. <laughs> but if, if I'm with my friends, I stopped putting on makeup years ago. I really don't care. But I still want to look pretty. So let's say I'm hanging out with a bunch of girlfriends, they take a picture of us, they want to put that picture online. I first make them put a filter over the picture, and my skin looks amazing. So my thought was, what if this guy's eyes work like an Instagram filter? <laughs> right? Like, what if he sees me in a Hudson? Come on, guys, why is that not a dating app? His eyes are broke, my face is broke, is this what soulmates are? I'm also hoping he can't see my mustache. I'm growing a mustache. <laughs> I've been growing it for a year. It's a passion project. <laughs> why I'm growing a mustache because my father couldn't grow facial hair until his 50s and now I want to be like have you ever tried estrogen? It's pretty 
seamlessly for me. I, uh, I've tried everything to get rid of my mustache. I've done the threading, I've done the waxing, I've done four packages of laser hair removal. Keeps coming back quicker and thicker. A friend of mine was like, are you transitioning? I was like, not willingly. I bleached it. That was my newest attempt, but now it doesn't match my eyebrows. <laughs> just been calling it my statement mustache. You just gotta own it at some point, guys. <laughs> I like this guy. He's, um, I feel bad for him, though. I'm, I'm not fun to date for both personal and professional reasons. We'll get to personal later. Let's start professionally. <laughs> Never home. Constantly traveling. It's been a problem in all my relationships, but this new guy's actually been handling it pretty well. So I just got back from doing a tour for a month, and right before this tour, he sent me an email with his schedule for the week, and all he wrote is, I want to make sure I see you before you go. Oh. Right? That's all I've ever wanted from a man. <laughs> I can't tell you how many fights have escalated with dudes where they're like, what do you want from me? And I'm like, to sink calendars. <laughs> right? Like, I don't really care about marriage. I just want to know where you are at all times. <laughs> I have a lot of anxiety. Your schedule feels like a blanket of love. Yes, I'm going through your phone, but it's not because of other women. I just want to know what you're going to be doing at 10 p.m. I'm a different kind of psycho. Nobody talks about us. Before this dude, I hadn't been in a relationship in two years, and I spent the two years alone being like, why does nobody want to be with me? And then I got into a relationship, and I was like, they all made the right dozen John. <laughs> I'm a lot. I'm a lot, and I know I'm a lot, because I was seeing this guy for a little while a year ago. He dumped me out of the blue. I called my little sister up crying, and to make me feel better, she just kept telling me how intense I was. <laughs> She's like, well, you're really intense, and the right guy's going to be able to handle your intensity, and it's because you're so intense. And I was like, could we use another word? <laughs> like, maybe I'm alone because I'm so pretty. <laughs> like, who taught you how to give pep talks? You're the worst. <laughs> But she was right. She was right, and I knew she was right. So after about three dates with this guy, I knew I really liked him, and I told my therapist. I asked her, like, what should I do? And she was like, have you tried not being yourself? <laughs> Dude, it's like the best advice my friends weren't brave enough to give me. This is, this is an example of my intensity. So not too long ago, I was uh, working in L.A. for a couple of weeks. Then I was going to be home for, like, two days, and then I was gonna be off to Europe for a month. I was barely gonna see this guy. So he suggested, how about I come out to LA and visit you? And I was like, oh my God, totally wants to be my boyfriend. <laughs> so I was staying with my sister at the time and I recommended, why don't we get an Airbnb so we can have some alone time? So he starts looking up options. He texts me two options. He's like, do you wanna stay here or here? And I was like, here. He's like, great. Then 10 minutes later, he sent me seven more options. <laughs> Looked through all of them. I was like, this one. He's like, perfect. Then the next day, he sent me five more options. I was like, dude, what are you doing? All we're going to do is sleep and fuck. If the reviews say we slept well, we fucked well, that's a great place for us. A parked car in the shade is a good option for us. Why are you overthinking this? I was like, oh, I was just trying to do something special for us. Shit. <laughs> How was I supposed to handle that better? I've been thinking about it for days. This is what I think I was supposed to say. <laughs> Thanks, babe. <laughs> is anybody hard? <laughs> I wrote it down. My therapist would call that great emotional growth. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you guys, I'm not, I'm not good at this stuff. I'm not good at it, and I'm not good at it like every step of the way. So we, uh, we just had the talk, the like, what are we talk. I mean, I don't know if we had it. I had it. He was present. <laughs> it actually resulted in me saying the dumbest thing I've ever said out loud. I didn't even say it to him. I said it to my best friend a week later because she asked, is this dude your boyfriend? And I said... My therapist told me I could call him my boyfriend. <laughs> now I have to be in therapy forever. So this is what happened. So I asked him, what are we? And he said, well, we're not seeing anybody else. And I was like, great. Covered this a couple of months ago. Good recap. <laughs> Continue. But he's like, I'm not ready to put a label on it. 
So I swallowed my feelings. I was like, deal with you later, feelings. <laughs> and I said nothing. And then a couple moments later, he asked me about the health of my uterus. <laughs> Weird. <laughs> Not completely out of nowhere, though, because a couple months earlier, I found out I have a polyp growing in my uterus. You don't need to know what that is. You just need to know it doesn't belong there. And it has to be surgically removed. And I had told him, so now fast forward, we're in bed. I'm like, what are we? He's like, what's up with your broken uterus? <laughs> I don't know what that means. And I don't know what to say. So I say nothing. And then I guess he kind of clarifies, because he's like, well, do you ever want to have kids someday? I was like, I don't know, man. I don't even know if I want to keep this polyp. <laughs> I mean, I did name it. I named it Polly. <laughs> You know, whether it's a boy or cancer. <laughs> That's the best that line's ever done. Thank you. <laughs> I do think things are getting serious with this guy. Um, I just met his parents. Well, that's not true, they're divorced. I met someone important and someone less so. <laughs> it was scary nonetheless. I haven't met a dude's parents in so long. I just like, I'm just not in parent meeting shape. I curse for a living. I wasn't even sure if I could turn that off. I was so scared I was gonna be myself. <laughs> Most terrifying is that I met him at a Rosh Hashanah dinner. Again, not Jewish, just have the face of one. So I, I don't know anything about Judaism. And if I'm being honest, I don't know anything about my own religion. I, I wasn't raised religious. I had to deduce that shit for myself. So I'm one of five kids. My parents are filled with anger and guilt. You put those symptoms in Google, you're Catholic. <laughs> you know, I tell people I'm Catholic, but I don't know. I just know I don't like myself. I feel Catholic. <laughs> so what I'm saying is I, I went into this dinner blind, but it was great. Three-hour dinner was going amazing up until the end because then I went to hug his stepdad, and I was like, can I say happy Rosh Hashanah? Is that like a thing? And he's like, yeah, why? And I was like, I don't know, man, you guys have so many sad holidays and I didn't want to be a dick about it. <laughs> Actually, it's one of the most honest assessment of Jews I've ever heard. And I was like, sweet, am I Jewish now? I had a matzah thing, can I have money? <laughs> I do like this guy, this guy is, um, I don't know, he's different from anybody I've ever dated. He, uh, he tells me no. All the time. It's wild. <laughs> I, uh, I don't know, I appreciate it though, because he has likes and dislikes and he voices them and he has boundaries and he doesn't let me push them. And I do think when you date somebody for a long time and you're constantly just doing what the other person wants, you're just pleasing them, not really getting to know them, and I think it can cause a lot of resentment. So I like that about him. But that doesn't mean it doesn't piss me off <laughs> most of the time. So not too long ago, I was like, hey babe, do you want to see that movie A Star is Born? I heard it was pretty good. And he's like, no. <laughs> I'm not saying that. I was like, okay. You'll pay for this. <laughs> We've been dating for a bit now, and um, I don't know what it is. I, I don't know if it's because I'm older, I don't know if it's like peer pressure of society, but I, I started to push him. You know what I mean? Like, that kind of, I never thought I'd be that woman, but I did. I started to push him. I was like, you know what? I was like, I think. We should put you in therapy. Uh, mostly because me and my therapist were tired of carrying the relationship. It is such a burden on her to always fix him through me. I, I bullied him. I did. I bullied him for a full year. I won. He started going a couple of months ago and it is not working. <laughs> I'll tell you guys, I've been in therapy for eight years. I'm pretty much done. I'm good. I'm perfect. You guys have met me. And if I'm being really truthful, I kind of think I go to therapy now for maintenance. Because I don't think I'm going to get any better, but I also don't think I'm going to get any worse. It's like the same reason I go to the gym. Right? Like, I'm just trying to continue to fit into the pants I currently own. And I don't want him to have that same emotional comfort. And I get that it's super cliche for a woman to be up here saying she's trying to fix a man or change a man. But why is that a bad thing? Why is that not a compliment? I like you. I'm invested in you. I want you to be good enough for me. <laughs> Can I not put that on a dating profile? Like emotionally refurbished woman seeking man that's tried a little? Like if you haven't been in therapy, 
be at least two years, you need not apply. Because <laughs> we're older, it's okay to have baggage, but you go to Maria Kondo some of that shit. <laughs> um, <yeah. laughs> Those are my example. These, uh, these are my favorite boots. I bought these boots four years ago for $40. They're trash. They break down all the time. I always get them fixed. I've invested $200 into these boots. Right? Because when I got them, I liked them. Then I started to wear them every day. They started to mold to my feet. And now I love them. I'm trying to re-soul my boyfriend. Is that coming across? I'm like a man cobbler. Call me Geppetto. But I'm trying to turn this Pinocchio into a real man that expresses his feelings. I'm going to get new boots. Watch out, man. <laughs> it's a little softer than I wanted it to be. That would hurt my feelings. I do like this dude. I do. I like him a lot. He's a he's a really good guy. He's um he's just a bad communicator. And I know you're like, but I'm all hard. Um, <laughs> it's bad. It's really bad. It's, it's bad. He's broken. I like him broken. If you have a wall built around your heart, I will fuck it. I've been doing it since high school. It's my thing. And I'm broken too. I'm not judging him. I've just been in therapy long enough and I've read like four self-help books and I am better than him. And he's a good guy. I have to stress it. He's a really good dude. He's never said anything mean to me ever, but he's also never said anything nice. The man says nothing. And I can't handle it. I literally talk about my fears and feelings for applause breaks. Like you don't get into comedy because you need the average amount of love. Like compliments. The only thing that keeps us together is he texts me every day. Since the first day we met, every single day he texts me and I love that shit. I need that shit. I don't even care what's in these text messages, by the way. All I need to know is that he thought about me and he's not dead. Those are the only requirements. So he can send me like a pigeon emoji or a picture of him making out with another woman. She looks cute. Get it, babe. Okay, so this is what happened not too long ago. Um, we both travel for work. So he was gonna go to Ecuador for work and he warns me. He's like, there's not a lot of service there. I might not be able to text you every day. Totally fine. I was like, it's fine. It's fine. Fine. Four days go by, I hear nothing. And then I get one single text message. And all it says is one bar on a mountain. And then I don't hear from him for three days. What? <laughs> the fuck does that mean? Are you dying? Are you in trouble? Is this your 127 hours moment where you have your arm lodged in a rock and you need me to fax a goat to come rescue you? <laughs> or did somebody tip you off and tell you the only place that you can find service in this country is at the top of this mountain, so in between work, you hiked up this mountain because you miss me so goddamn much. And you love me so fucking... This is the long text message he received three days later when he finally got service. Because I can't. I can't. I can't. God forbid anything real happens to him. He's on a plane. The engine blows out. The plane starts heading towards the earth. The captain gets on the intercom. He goes, hey guys, we're not going to make it. I would start calling and texting your loved ones. I would receive a text that was like, hey babe. Landing early. <laughs> thank you so much, guys. You were awesome. Thank you, thank you, thank you.